Welcome to Guernica Editions Poets Sankeset Interview Series, a collaborative project of Canadian poets and independent presses. Guernica Editions is based in Hamilton, situated upon the traditional and unceded territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. Today, Antonio D'Alfonso and Ruth Panofsky will be in conversation and will read from their recent poetry collections, and they have a couple poems they wrote just for us. Poet, novelist, essayist, translator, Antonio D'Alfonso has published more than 50 books, including translations, and has made three feature films. He is the founder of Guernica Editions, which he managed for 33 years before passing it on to new owners in 2010. He moved to Toronto in 1991. For his writings, he won the Trillium Award, the Brassani Award, and the New York Independent Film Award for his film, Bruco. He holds a PhD from the University of Toronto. In 2016, he received an honorary doctorate from Athabasca University. His new film, Tata, Daddy, was released in July 2020. The Two-Headed Man Collected Poems, 1970-2020, was published by Guernica Editions in July 2020. Born and raised in Montreal, Ruth Panofsky has published three volumes of poetry, Lifeline, published by Guernica Editions in 2001, Laika and Nahum, a poem in two voices, published by Inanna Publications in 2007, which won the Vine Award for Canadian Jewish Literature, and Radiant Shards, Hoda's North End Poems, published by Inanna Publications in 2020. She currently lives in Toronto, where she is a professor of English at Ryerson University. Welcome, Ruth and Antonio. Hello, Ruth. Hi, Antonio. Nice to see you. Yes, I haven't seen you in a good 20 years. It's forever. It's forever. It's incredible. I'm so happy you, you did these two books. So that I'm talking about Laike and Kanum, which you published in 2007, and Radiant Shards, which you published in 2020. Both books examine the lives of immigrants of uh, the Jewish faith, at the turn of the century. I, I think they must be Russian, and I wasn't quite sure. Can you tell us what motivated you to portray the lives of these people from the past for the modern reader? The first book you're talking about, um, Leika Anachem, A Poem in Two Voices, uh, was a poem that I think was percolating forever. It's a poem that comes out of my relationship with my maternal grandmother, who I loved very much and actually had the opportunity to live with for a short period of time. And um, both my grandparents were immigrants to uh, Montreal. They came, my grandmother came when she was very little. So she was really for all intents and purposes Canadian. My grandfather came in his early twenties and he was very much always the immigrant. Um, and I was always interested in my own history, and it was so hard to really get at uh, because the lives of my grandparents were uh, lived in the present day and there were challenges and struggles and there were real difficulties that I probe in that book. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to do was give voice to these two figures and especially my grandmother who I admired and also uh, I really couldn't believe that she survived the hardships that she did. Uh, her life was very hard. And she came out as the most resilient, loving person, um, despite all the hardship. And so uh, that book was an attempt to really look back and also give voice to my grandmother. And so, and I also really like the idea of entering into the inner world of people and writing out of this kind of imagined space of their inner lives because they didn't really have a chance to uh, give voice to their own experiences. And uh, I felt kind of called to do that for them. 
The other book that also speaks in the other, in somebody uh, else's voice is um, my newest book called Radiant Shards that you mentioned, Huda's North End Poems. And it gives voice to a fictional character. And um, the fictional character was created by Adele Wiseman in her 1974 novel, Crackpot. Uh, she was based fleetingly on a real person. There was in fact, a Jewish sex worker in the north end of Winnipeg during, uh, in the period between the, the, the wars. And, um, but Wiseman recreates her as this larger than life figure, but she talks about her in the first, in the third person. And when I read her, I, I related to this character, I don't know why, maybe because she was this um, uh, remarkable, voluble person. And, um, the fact that she wasn't saying things in her own voice, uh, I just I just wanted to do that for her. And it, the same thing happened there. I was able to go back in time, imagine the world of Huda and give a voice to her. Um, my impulse is always to look at the past through women. And uh, both my grandmother and Huda are really strong figures. Uh, suffering figures, but incredibly strong figures at the same time. And so I think both projects were an, an attempt to pay homage to them, but also to describe the embodied experience of women who couldn't really do it for themselves because of circumstances. So that's what brought me to those two books. So Antonio, you and I both were born in Montreal. We share that. Uh, I also want to say that I'm indebted to you because I think you made me a poet. You published my first book, Lifeline, in 2001 when you were head of Guernica, and I'm indebted to you for that. But I, I want to I want to ask you about Montreal. You've lived there for much of your life. Do um, you think the city has had an influence on your writing? Um, has it influenced the way you think about artistic connections and literary community? Montreal is this kind of mythical space as much as a real space. And I wonder if you can uh, describe the hold it has on you. I did. I have lived in Toronto for 20 years and I lived in Mexico for one year and two years in Rome. In Rome on, off and off, off on and off. I came back here in 2010 thinking that I would be able to uh, capture a reality that is uh, disappearing, which is the Anglophone Italian reality. I'm writing about it now in my memoir. I lived in a city called Saint Michel, which was uh, annexed in '67 and destroyed basically by the Montreal thing. I used to love Montreal. I I used to be a um, a believer in it, but I I stopped in 1990. I died. So I, I don't feel, I never felt a connection to Montreal. Uh, I felt I was connected to writers. But um, it is only later on that I discovered that the writers I liked were born in Montreal. You know, some of them were immigrants, but uh, strangely enough, a lot of people do not come from Montreal. Uh, uh, either they come from the country, or the, Montreal was a stop. I don't mean to be negative about Montreal. What I think that Montreal that created me no longer exists. And uh, therefore, it is not a place of inspiration anymore for me. I feel it like a, a very, like a prison, in fact, because since 1992, I think the, the city has become a totally different place project and you either part of it you're not which I'm not I decided not to be part of it I do not want to be a, a fifth class citizen and uh, I'm trying to capture that reality of uh, that I knew as a child uh, from 1953 to 19 let's say 1990 but uh, it's very hard because, uh, you know, the first Anglophone I met, I mean, Anglophone was a Jewish lady at, uh, 
at uh, Loyola in 1970. Before that, we were all Italians with a couple of Irish and one or two Polish people. But basically, we were all Italian or, you know, we were going into the same schools. We didn't speak the same language, so we had to speak English. So that's why we spoke English. And we played, because we were in the east part of the city, we played with francophones. So that gave us a, unis a unicity that uh, that made me who I am, and that is something which I want to remember. But when I when I went to Loyola, that's where I discovered the Anglophone writers. Uh, I mean, I knew about Leonard Leonard Cohen before, for, because of an older sister of a friend of mine, of a neighbor, she had bought her LP in nineteen sixty his LP in nineteen sixty six, and that you know wow that was interesting for me, but not because I was a poet, just wow what a finally a voice from montreal i was able to uh, identify because i was not identifying with the french songs at all you know and so yeah leonard cohen became a major figure but if we look back at that it's the jewish thing that interests me which i'm discovering now so today uh, i i i play a lot of music and it's a lot with the jewish friends you know, people who are my age who who grew up in Montreal and who left, who came back. And so that is very new for me because it's uh, that bridging of the Jewish culture and the Italian culture should have been done many, many decades ago. And we never did because we went to different types of schools. And uh, so I regret that, basically. And uh, I, it, it is something that I would have liked to have, I would have loved to you learn Yiddish, for instance. I'm, I regret all of that stuff because I did not know it. I can't regret it. I, I see it now and I, I'm curious, right? The rest of the stuff is about being Italian. I mean, that's, a, you know, thousands of pages, yeah. right? I mean, but the, the, that I don't talk about anymore. I decided uh, it's too political. I would have written. I will write another book about it and it stopped. Uh, I will not no longer talk about it because... Uh, it leads us into heavy politics, and uh, no one wants to talk about that. And that's why I called Guernica Guernica. <laughs> it's an anarchist place, you know, and I, I am profoundly anti-nationalist, and uh, and I believe that ethnicity has nothing to do with nationalism, you know, and it's something that Canada could offer the world. Unfortunately, we're not a racist-free society. It speaks to the ri richness and the... Uh, aspects of Montreal and its uh, uh, its history in a very probing way. I'm looking forward to your memoir. It'll be it'll be really really interesting. Maybe I'll follow up then with a que with a question then because you you decided to become a publisher in 1978 when you established Guernica. Um, I'd love to hear about those early days in publishing. Like, how did you how did you even begin? Did you work out of your house? Did you work alone? Did you work with others? Um, did you receive any kind of financial support at this point in the early days? Uh, how did it how did it start? Uh, it started by uh, at Loyola by reading magazines, just discovering writers. I, I, I quit literature classes because I, uh, I found them very uninteresting. Uh, also, I had three uh, awful experiences with teachers, you know, abuse, sexual abuses there. Therefore, that put my, my death to, um, to literature. So I went to film, uh -huh. get away from, um, from that reality. So um, when I f came back to writing, it was because uh, I uh, I was following uh, the people from Vehicle Press. You can see their books in bookstores or in Argo or whatever. And I, you know, it's not as if I stopped to buy books. I mean, uh, but I did look at books. I mean, I, I liked books. I had published my first book in 1973. So uh, I was interested by something. And so I went to look at that something, and it was the vehicle ports, and uh, and I was married. I got married in 1978 with a Mexican woman from a higher class. I, I come from a very low-class family. Uh, 
I, I, <laughs> you know, I mean, they, there's no books in my house. Uh, books are uh, are considered dust gatherers, right? Um, and so, um, when I uh, decided to to do something, I just said one night, uh, "Oh, you know, they'll never publish what we want, what I want to do." And uh, I decided. Let me phone this young this young publisher called Marco Fraticelli, and he lived right next door in NDG. We had been writing to each other for at least five years, four years, and he was my neighbor all along. I never knew that. And uh, we got together, and I said, let me publish you, I told him. I'll pay for it. You know, I, I was working at Bell Canada then um, as a spy. As a was, spy? Yeah, as a spy. Uh, as a spy because they were inventing, uh, they had introduced the... Uh, Fiber optics. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, that's a good story. Yeah, that's a great story. <laughs> and uh, and so my wife, Carmen, uh, she said, listen, just do it. What's it's going to cost you? It's going to cost you $20,000. Uh, $2, do it. So we did it. Uh, I went to Vehicle Press, Simon Dardick. He, he printed the books for me. And uh, that's how it began. And, and it was... It always has been for the for the thirty five years I had, except for a small two year period where I I wanted to divide the house from the publishing house, and that was in Montreal with my second wife. That's in nineteen, just before I went to Toronto in nineteen nineteen ninety, because it was putting a terrible stress on it does put a lot of stress on marriages. Because I work at home, and my first love was that addiction. I was addicted to books, to publishing. Uh, Canada Council helped me. Uh, Quebec never helped me. I invested every penny. Uh, every book cost $10,000. I had to pay for it, and uh, I got myself into debt, uh, heavily debt, a lot of debt. And uh, I said at one point... It was 2010. I had to stop because uh, I was going to lose. I had lose my. I had lost my third wife because of Guernica. So um, it, it, it's an addiction. So uh, because it's like gambling. Uh, I know publishing books is, uh, you know, you 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 work with with a person. You have to pull out the book out of the person. We have now. You must realize that now with the schools that universities that teach classes about writing, but you know, and back when I started, that didn't exist. Most of these people were professors and uh, or housewives, right? And to pull a book out of them was really difficult, and uh, that takes a lot of energy. And I would push them then and help them do a second book, help them do a third book, and and. You know, hopefully, hopefully things would work out. But you know, the working going to Toronto was uh, was war territory. You know, it's uh, I went to live downtown Toronto, and it's something that no one does. I did. I'm I, I'm Italian. I want to live downtown, or, or else I would I would go back to the country, right? I mean, and I I'm not from the I we left it, we left it uh, fifty years ago, six seventy years ago. I wanted to live downtown, and that led me to a lot of problems because people thought I was a lot, a lot richer than I really was. And so um, that was uh, awful. I had to go to court against the government wow. because I was publishing Italian authors from outside, uh, authors from outside Canada, which we're not allowed to do. That is all done uh, personally. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, that personal thing becomes a cell and that cell has to be subtracted from the official Canadian cells which means you I was accused of fraud which for poetry what are we talking about like ten thousand dollars you know but it, it were really really after me they were out to destroy me wow so I had to leave and besides the atmosphere had changed and uh, uh, you know people are very competitive and uh, I'm not I started this as an ignorant man, I learned to read. I learned this. I discovered a world as a publisher. I published around a thousand people. Yeah. 
published 500 books. I still help people. And uh, that's what led me. But I have to thank Carmen, my first wife. She's the one that said, you can do it. So I'm going to, to read um, some poems from, from Radiant Shards. And here's the cover of that book that was uh, published by Inanna Publications in just um, uh, April 2020 in the middle uh, of COVID. Um, and this book, as I mentioned, uh, is spoken in the voice of a fictional character. Her name is Hoda, and Hoda is an obese Jewish sex worker who services the boys and men of North End Winnipeg, which was very much a Jewish enclave. Um, and the story kind of um, uh, spans uh, the period um, in the middle of uh, the 20th century up until the end of the Second World War. Huda kind of falls into becoming a sex worker because she needs to somehow support her and her father after her mother dies. Her mother is a hunchbacked woman. Her father is blind and her mother has supported the family by cleaning homes. She dies from a tumor and then Huda is left to somehow figure uh, things out because uh, there's no other way uh, that she and, her husband, she and her father could stay together. And so um, this book is, is divided into six sections and um, the poems I'm gonna read you from, uh, read from are, are in the second section called The Initiation. The first time I wrap my legs around Morgan tightly, then tighter, he cries, I love you, I love you, I love you. Words to hear, words I need to hear to do it again with my Morgo, my dear Morgo. Morgan lied, I'm not his one and only girl of his dreams. You're friendly, funny, and you put out but love, he says, no dice, so long. I just wanted also to show you that um, I use archival images in this book uh, from the Jewish Heritage Center in Western Canada. And this is the figure that I've chosen to represent as Morg Morgan, uh, uh, Huda's first uh, a customer as it is. Um, and then I'm going to just move forward a bit in time during this same section initiation. I do not judge, never say no blow job, absolutely no gang shag. So they let loose with good old cheer on raunchy huda. Aroused boys cling to me. I take them in, hold them close. There is ample room in the rollicking fun that brings them back often to my place of reckoning. Lewd, you say? Yeah, I'm lewd, crude, and coarse too. I make my way with my body. What else would I be? A polite little Sue, refined and ladylike? No way, no damn way. And then I'll close with um, what I've called the coda. And actually, um, this, is, this is an image of my version of Huda, uh, somebody who I think was actually in real life a telegraph operator, uh, but, <laughs> but I've taken her um, to be my idea of Huda. And this coda is something that I imagine as having been found among Huda's private papers, which of course is, is an imaginative cache because Huda never existed, but it's an homage to her body. I bless this aging body for it is sound. I curse this aging body for it is weak. I embrace its persistence, abhor its flaps and folds, rely on its strength and deny its force. One day I waken to its will and can. The body is guide, the body is guile, the body is grace, the body is mine. Over to you, Antonio. Beautiful. So um, I'm going to read from uh, Guernica published uh, this book called Two-Headed Men, Men, Collected Poems, 1970 to 
2020. Thank you, Guernica. I'm very touched they did it. So I'm going to read um, 50 poems. <laughs> <laughs> I'll read two poems. Maybe, <laughs> two, two, maybe three. How to talk about Helen. How to talk about Helen. Helen who lived across the street from us. Who was older than I was. She was the sister of my friend. Of my friends. Helen who was extremely attractive. We all desired her. Her brothers included. But we knew she did not work. She should have worked. But she didn't. We used to have conversations on her porch. She was so sensitive. I don't know how to talk about Helen. How to talk about Helen? When the only image I really have of her is my father waking me up one night, telling me, your friend is naked on the street and it's three in the morning. Should we call the police or bring her in ourselves? How do I talk about Helen? <coughs> Loren. So these are two women that lived in front of my house. You know, I, I saw them. I saw them. I grew up. They grew up. So Loren. I would wait for her to sit on the porch every evening. I would wait for her to drive home on her blue Vespa every evening. I was scared she would notice me behind the shut blinds. If I found the courage, I would run out to say hello. She was 10 years older than me, and she would indulge and talk. I would wait for her to sit on the porch every evening. And when she would, when I could, I would open up and sweat. Then I would not say hi to her for a week. I wonder if she ever saw me in the living room. I wonder if she ever realized that I became a man waiting for her to sit on the porch every evening. I want to lead to your poetry. Radiant Shards is your reading of Adele Wiseman's novel, Crackpot. Why did you want to poeticize what was prose? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I couldn't help it. <laughs> That's the truth of it. Um, well, first of all, I've been working on Adele Wiseman in my other life, which is as a, as a professor. So I've been reading and writing about Adele Wiseman for a long time. Um, she's a Jewish Canadian woman writer of my mother's generation, actually, she was born the same year as my mother. And I always wanted to find a record of Jewish woman's experience. You know, there was lots of record of male experience. You know, I could look at Richler, for example, who was actually a friend of my father's. They went to high school together. So he wrote about what it was like to be a male in that world. And um, it took me a long time to find the story of women in that world. So when I came to Wiseman and Miriam Waddington, for example, and a few others, I really felt, oh, at last. And so Wiseman spoke to me. And, uh, but when I came across her character of Hoda in that novel, Crackpot, which in fact was really, uh, it, it was not very well received in its day because it uh, treats the taboo subject of incest and, and, and uh, you know, a sex worker and, um, 
and at the same, and obesity. I mean, all of these uh, subjects that are now very timely um, and are being dealt with openly. But in 74, it was just, you know, not really something that was discussed. Um, and so Hoda kind of entered into my head and um, I never, she never left. Um, and uh, after, I've, after my book, Leica and Nachum, um, uh, there was a, a lull in terms of poetry writing because I was busy doing other projects. And then she, that she just came to me, you know, she, her voice started coming to me. It was just like that. <laughs> All these years of living with Adele Wiseman, Hoda just kind of surfaced and I needed to write from her perspective. I realized that that was the next voice that I needed to um, uh, give poetry to. And, and it was because I related to her experience as a vulnerable young person who lived through trauma, really. She was traumatized and she was abused and, and there wasn't any support for her. And, I, and she lived during the most turbulent um, moments in 20th century history, especially for Jews, although she was semi-protected from it by being in North America. But there was all of that encapsulated in her character that spoke to me. And so that's why I, I did it. Um, and it isn't as if, uh, you know, writing in the voice of fictional characters or taking up fictional characters anew. It's done. It's been done a lot. Um, uh, and so I didn't feel like I needed to justify that. Um, but, and, and anyway, I, I, uh, I felt I kind of owed it to Hoda to let her speak <laughs> in her own voice. So that's why I did it. And I just, um, I liked it so much. It, it was very, very freeing for me too, because uh, she had lived in my head for so long. It was, uh, it was a wonderfully um a liberating experience to just get her on the page. Why poetry? It just, well, yeah, why poetry? So one of the things I, I have discovered as I write poetry is my poetry is very spare and stripped down, as, as you've mentioned. And I try to build it up. Actually, it comes out when, when, you know, drafts, various drafts come out and there's much more in those drafts. And I find that as I revise, uh, the poems become even sparer because it's the essence that I'm trying to get at. And the, the, my poetry really seeks to get at the essence of things. And um, in fact, in the characters that I write about, because they are as much characters as they are speakers, they, um, they live in lives that are so full of incident and noise and there hasn't been their op the opportunity to really get at their inner lives stripped bare to the essence. And that's what poetry lets me do. Like I, there is the context, there is the social and historical context. It's limbed very minimally, right? It's there and I hope it's understood. But my premise is I wanna get at them. I want their world and I want the noise to disappear and I just want to go into that kind of crystallized space. So poetry lets me get there. What led you to sparseness? It just happened. <laughs> I keep thinking I, I can't write I can't write poems with a lot of words, <laughs> Antonio. <laughs> oh I don't know. Maybe because there's just so much there's so much verbiage. Um, and it's the idea of this crystallized experience that I'm trying to get at. So try as I might, you know, even when I put more words in, they seem to want to be taken out as I revise. Uh, I translated you in French, and it was a pleasure to... You really capture something with this, uh, this whiteness around it. Yeah. You, you really, it's too. masterful. Masterful. Thank you. You're so generous to say that. I really appreciate it. No, it's the truth. You are a master. You've won awards for your work in several fields, multiple fields. I am. A, I. You are so prolific. Uh, you've published books of poetry and essays. You've published novels. And as you've just mentioned, you're a translator, a prolific translator. 
plus you're a filmmaker. Um, so uh, many people would, um, you know, really aspire to, uh, you know, master one field, and yet you move, you seem to move so easily across these various modes. Um, how do you do that? And maybe also, why do you do that? Why, why do you feel called um, to work across so many different modes? I think it's to spite T.S. Eliot, <laughs> where he says at one point, a poet cannot be a prose writer. And he was a great prose writer. He was a great uh, essay writer. He's, he's probably a better essay writer than he is a poet in many ways. And I'm joking. I mean, he's a great poet. He influenced me a lot. I'm joking. But the two main writers and people in my life that uh, affected me very young, uh, Cocteau. I was four years old when I saw Orfe on TV. And Cocteau was a major playwright, a poet, a filmmaker, he had, uh, an artist. Mm. So he's a, a, someone I aspired to be. He was gay, I wasn't, but he had everything else that I loved, you know. And the other person I, that I loved who did the same thing, it's uh, Pasolini. Again, a gay guy, but I wasn't gay, or else I would have followed that whole reality of mixing. Why, do, why does one mix? It's because I can do it. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to write more poetry. I mean, I, I think this is it. To write more poetry would be, I would like to do it under a different name. You know, I don't want to, I want to do prose now. I want to, I, I want to do essays, uh, published th three novels. I translated uh, two or three novels. But I like prose. I'm starting to discover that. But there again, uh, in, uh, it's because I do the same thing in different fields. Uh, this professor who translated me in Brazil, she said, uh, when she watched my film Tata, my last film, Three Hours, she said, it's exactly like your novels. And I said, yeah, it's the same mind. You know, I can't do what you do, for instance. You do little scenettes, which I find is, is amazing. And those scenettes become a film, and that's what I do. But I would not be able to be that linear like you are. You just, somehow there's, it's sparse, and that's why I love your writing, because you're not boringly linear. You take away stories and... Oh, she's got an abortion. <laughs> oh, right? <laughs> you go back and you say, where did I miss it? I love that. I mean, how could I miss? There's only five words on the page. I missed something. You know, that, that is cinematographic. I studied in film. I mean, that's all I studied in. Uh, I did my BA, my master's. I, I did my semiology. I became a scientist and I invented a way to analyze films. And I did my PhD, you know, on, in film. And I... Uh, and I do film, so it took me a long time. It's much more expensive. And uh, what's nice about film is that you have someone else reading your stuff. There's one thing I hate, and I had to deal with it as a writer, as a publisher, writer going to uh, every night, going out to listen to poets read, Back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, I did it every night. 90s, stopped at the, age, at the 20 when I had a child. But I would go every night out, close the bars, listen to the people. And they were basically, all of them read the same way. I like Margaret Atwood. You know, and please, I, I love Margaret Atwood. But, you know, but it's, she put that style. Because before that, they didn't have that. I remember... Uh, seeing even uh, a man like Marshall McLuhan read his little text and he was animated. It, it, it's, it's, it is with body politics when she, she introduced this coldness in writing of this mon monotonous tone which, which colored all of literature because I could see a different voice. And when I went to, to the Quebec side, once in a while you had this person, ah! I said, well, that's interesting. And then I went to France, you had the same type of stuff going or Unless in Italy, in Italy they're all old and wearing, you know, wearing as straight jackets. But what I what I discovered was when you gave it to an actor, he could read your text and put a life to the to those lines that the writer doesn't even think, incapable of doing this. So to do that was a pleasure to say 
I'm going to, my films are basically poems that I film. I mean, literally, every, every scene is a poem that's read. It's always the same story. I mean, the, the same addiction, the same fascination for pluralism. You know, I'm, that's all that, that interests me. I want to hear different voices. So film enabled me to analyze poetry in a um, humane way, in an uh, everyday way, you know, and uh, that I really enjoyed. And lastly, uh, and that's why I find you, you're amazing in your poetry, where you could, you could in very few words, uh, de depict nonverbal actions. I have a, a COVID poem that comes out of the wonderful lull that we were afforded um, in the summer. And it's a poem um, that emerged out of a visit to Montreal. It's called Rêve au chocolat. On the Montreal terrace of Juliette, Juliette et Chocolat, my mother sips her chocolat chaud from a small white bowl. Behold, it's like drinking velvet. It's COVID time and we are sharing ice cream. Three scoops, chocolat, vanille, noisette, from a larger bowl, also white, as I lament the constraints on human connection, she is displaced to a world less altered, strolls familiar streets guided by a beloved grandfather, cuddles a baby brother safe in arms of a devoted sister, kicks ball on the scrappy turf of youth. In chocolate reverie, she returns to the time of grounding as our ice cream melts in the fading warmth of evening. This is the first poem I write in, I would say about five years, mm. except for translation, which, you know, they're poems too. But. So this is called 10 01 It's 8.01. Curfew in town. Every citizen is scrutinized. Despite searching every brick, every mortar, not a sound is. Not an image is seen. The trees are not real. The river is not real. The lights are not real. What lies outside my window is unreal. I touch my thigh. I twitch my toes. I pull on the sciatic nerve, hoping it will shoot a shot of pain. I scream, I'm alive! I call the police. I call the prime minister. I phone, but no one answers. I believe nothing out there is real. This is a case of missing persons. On the other shore mirrors the prison I'm living in on this shore. What I have been looking at is a reflection of what I am living. That silhouette there is me staring at me here. Politicians blame it on beings from another planet. The light I view out there, is it an illusion or my neighbor's hand? in need. Voila. You said something earlier, having just read this powerful poem, that you're, you don't foresee writing any more poetry. Um, after having just spent this time putting together The Two-Headed Man, which covers 
the years 70 to, 20, to 2020. I mean, that, that's a, a life's work. Um, so how did it feel to return to the body of work that you brought into the two-headed man? And, and why do you think you're not going to write any more poems? One of my poets I like, again, his name is Tom Gunn. He published his first book with Ted Hughes many, many years ago, and I, I think it must have been early 60s. And I, I bought, just before he died, I bought his collected. And his collected is basically same thing. It's Faber and Faber in America. I forgot. I think it's a Giro Strauss. It's you know, it's a, it's three hundred pages. And uh, he says, "This is it. I don't. Want, I don't want to write anymore. I, what I have to say is said. I mean, I don't need to, to to continue. I mean, um, I will repeat myself, and it's it serves no purpose." You know, uh, he writes about being gay, and uh, my stuff is about being. Uh, it's about the man who discovers that he's Italian and uh, Italian outside of Italy. I mean, that he is an ethnic, that he is a uh, a person without a land, without a, and he doesn't want it. That's the different thing. People before me decried it. Ah, I want the land. Or nostalgia. No, I'm happy. I have none of that shit. I'm happy. I, let me be the first one to say this is the best way to go. Now, oh, there are people who are preventing me from saying this, and that's what my book is about, and, that, and my essays are, are saying the same thing. And so, when I went through through the whole poetry book, it. It's an older man looking at the the stuff. So there aren't that many books out there of my work. So I didn't feel as if... Uh, I mean, there were one or two poems which are famous uh, that are being used at school. I, I actually changed the titles. So that was a major... That was a major choice, right? Because they were known under this title. I decided one of them is called uh, Italia, Italia Mia Amore. And it was uh, it was this, this scream uh, when I first discovered in 1984 that I was a WAP. And um, and what it meant and and the problem was that when, with that title it led me back to Italy and I said no that that's not now as an older man I'm allowed to say fix that up I mean that was a mistake. You see to answer your question if there are mistakes I had to correct them. You know, you cannot wash your hands and say, well, it was a younger man who said, no, I don't believe that. I believe that if you said something stupid, something racist, sexist, or whatever it is, I mean, it comes out in your text, and not you. If one looks back at one's poetry and realizes that he's an asshole, you got to take it out. So, that, so therefore, I, did not, I never felt guilty about changing anything. Mm. Besides, it's your stuff. I mean, I, the reason I mentioned to, uh, Tom Gunn, because he's, he's, he on the contrary says, I don't want to touch. I yeah. want to respect the young man. That's why I mentioned Tom Gunn. But he's very important. Uh, he, he, he raises that issue of, do you redo it or don't you redo it? You know? And he said, you got to respect the young man. I, I don't respect the young man. I mean, he, that young man needed a, a slap in the head. <laughs> You know? but, yeah, I know because that is that is something that um, writers uh, have to deal with, especially poets, right? When they go back to putting together a collected, what do you do with how how, how much revision do you do, um, and uh, and do you respect the younger person who wrote this work? Yeah, you respect your, you respect the poem. If the poem needs to be redone, you redo it. You don't respect the person, you respect the work. I'm going back into my own past, like my, and so it's, it's kind You're of- that the, old, eh? Yeah, that, <laughs> that old. And so it's not the, not the immigrant, not the immigrant, but the next generation, you know? Um, and it's still a Jewish enclave, though I will say that, but it's, um, 
it's suburban, and I find that the poems I'm writing now that I think will shape into a collection are uh, writing out of my own um, experience in as a uh, uh, basically, you know, third generation Jewish person, um, but it's centered in the suburb where I was born and raised, which is in uh, north of Montreal, Laval. And the suburb was at one point like predominantly Jewish, but you know, like all all um, uh, of these environments, they get um, groups move in and groups move out. Now it's predominantly Greek, but there was a period when um, you know many many Jews who couldn't afford to purchase homes in the city, they bought these bungalows, small bungalows where I was raised um, after being born in the city of Montreal. And there's a character. To that environment that I'm really um, looking at in these poems. And um, so they're taking me back to my own past, but then of course the past of my own parents that informs my life there, right? So I, I find that that's what I'm looking at now. So it's not as far removed, um, but it certainly is still of um, it is historical in many respects because it no longer exists uh, as a community. It exists um, in my mind. So that's where I'm at now. I have no idea what will come of it, um, uh, but they're being written in my voice. Mm, yeah. Do you see a link somehow? Is, is there a, um, a space, a, um, I don't want to use a landscape, a, a, a cultural space that is being created and that you want to see. I, I think there is a cultural space, but of course it develops over time. And I mean, mine is still very much rooted in a history of Ashkenazi Jewry, you know, and um, displacement and settlement, um, uh, displacement, uh, immigration and settlement, and then kind of entrenchment. So what happens on Canadian soil to that generation. So in fact, um, it's, it is, I'm one of the older groups of Jewish immigration. Um, my lineage is one of an older group of Jewish immigration to this country. There are many more current and, and recent waves of immigration from Israel, South Africa, from the former Soviet led countries, uh, uh, you know, Morocco in Montreal, for example, like that those experiences would be very, very different. So in a way, yes, I think I am still, I'm really, really rooted in a historical mindset. I am. And um, part of what I've been doing is trying to figure out um, what it means through the writing. Yeah, what it means um, to me. Uh, and I, I don't think I'm ever going to come to any kind of <laughs> uh, conclusion. It's all just process and working out and finding and finding a way through to um, a place where I can uh, locate myself. I, maybe that's why we write, right? To kind of locate ourselves for the moment. Yeah. Absolutely. Well yeah. put. I totally agree. Why the chosen isolation? And are you, are you uh, really not affected by COVID in terms of your own creativity? Can I ask why the chosen isolation? Well, there are two different questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, the isolation, because uh, I was profoundly disappointed by uh, by a lot of people. I was hurt. And um, exactly the month uh, 2012. I think it was the lowest moment in my life. And um, I went through a deep depression. So uh, I decided that I would no longer trust anybody go out in public and uh, I decided that I would study and that's what I'm doing I'm reading a lot uh, I'm reading I'm I did films I'm doing conversations now uh, in film I, I want I want to learn I want to like this uh, you know this is a very special moment I'm very honored to have you with me I need uh, humanity. The kind of work that you've done uh, as a publisher um, to begin with 
is an act of love. I mean, you yourself didn't use that word when you described uh, how you set out to when you were when you started Guernica, but it was really an act of of love that that led you there, and it's an act of love that. Um, well, uh, I loved our generation. Right, but also there was so much leading you um, on that journey. I mean, in terms of a love of, of writing, a love of wanting to foster a community of writers, a recognition yes. of, of plurality um, at a time when that was not valued, really. Uh, Guernica was a, really a groundbreaking uh, undertaking, and it grew into one that was really, really important and still is extremely important in terms of its mandate. It continues the mandate that you envisaged for it. So um, I, I just... I want to thank you for that. And oh, thank uh, you for being part I've of always it. Felt, I've always felt you there behind me, you know, always, because you were there for me at the very beginning. And I know that people feel that. I, I agree. Thank you. I, I accept it. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. The, the idea of growing old and ignorant is, a, is an amazing uh, I need to learn. And now I, I, I decided I want to read everything that I never wanted to read. Let me judge what I think is good. You know, I don't want to be told this is good. So that's what I've been doing for the past 10 years, educating myself, learning how to read properly, learning just for myself, for the pleasure of learning. Thank you for watching Poets Sans Cassette with Guernica Editions. Stay tuned for our next interview next week. Don't forget to like and subscribe.